Well, thank you, Nishant, and I'm, uh, welcome everybody. This is going to be a, a hopefully a fun session we have here that can get us going. Now, uh, several learning objectives for this evening. First of all, to be able to determine whether retrograde conduction is even present or not, and then uh, know and recognize different patterns of retrograde conduction that may exist when conduction is present, and when it's absent, to be able to determine the site or level of block and S several of these objectives are what uh, what we found over years of being on the American Board of Internal Medicine when when uh, we were looking over the types of questions that um, candidates routinely missed. It, it was not the stuff that we thought was going to be hard. It was ECGs, reading ECGs, and uh, retrograde conduction were routinely missed on uh, the examination. Uh, so I thought it would be worthwhile to, to look at this sort of thing. Uh, now, I want to also distinguish between the concept of eccentric retrograde conduction and eccentric atrial activation in atrial tachycardia. I, I try to get my fellows to describe what they see rather than put an interpretation on it, because as soon as you start saying, oh, that's retrograde conduction, those are retrograde P waves, you put yourself into a little box and uh, you put on some blinders and say, I'm only going to think in those terms, whereas it may not actually be a retrograde P wave, it may be an atrial tachycardia. And finally, we want, I want to um, try to get us to understand distinctions between conduction of the AV node uh, versus an accessory pathway. I'm not going to be talking about perihisin pacing today, that's a, a topic unto itself. Uh, but I do want to talk about looking at the his potential and whether retrograde conduction, when it exists, depends on the presence of an antecedent his potential or is independent of it, we'll see how important that can be and how helpful that can be. All right, so uh, it's an everyday event to assess retrograde conduction. Every time you pace the ventricle and somebody who doesn't have atrial fibrillation, uh, you have an opportunity to look at retrograde conduction. It's completely ignored by a few folks who are too busy to, to uh, pay any attention to this, poorly understood by some, and as I uh, as really, uh, as Nishant and I have said, uh, answered incorrectly in board exams by an inordinate number of candidates. We have several tools available to us to make this assessment. First of all, the ECG. And don't forget this, it's at the top of all of our tracings in the lab. Uh, people zoom in on what's going on on the intracardiac recordings, but there's a lot of information on the surface ECG. And we'll try to tease some of that out a little bit later. His bundle recordings, of course, uh, presence or absence of his potential and also the effect of uh, premature ventricular complex or ventricular pacing on subsequent PR intervals or AH intervals. So even if you don't see a hiss, you can infer a lot about what's going on in the conduction system in the retrograde direction by seeing what happens to the PR interval or AH interval of subsequent beats. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have other atrial recordings available to us just to uh, help things out and um, uh, when we're talking about retrograde conduction, it refers to activation uh, of the atria either during a tachycardia or ventricular pacing. And we ask, ask the following questions. Is atrial activation related to ventricular activation at all or is there no, no relationship? If it is related, how did atrial activation occur? It could be over the AV node, his Purkinje system. It could be over one or more accessory pathways or some combination of these. It can get pretty, uh, pretty thorny sometimes. Almost as important as where conduction is, is where it is not. Where does conduction fail? Because if you don't have retrograde conduction, it always blocks somewhere. It could be in the AV node. It could be in the his Purkinje system. It could be in an accessory pathway, or again, some combination of these, uh, or all of the above. Now, uh, retrograde conduction may be present, and when, I, when I, we're talking amongst our fellows, I, I like to get them to think in terms of two different axes. Uh, each of these should be assessed separately because each has their own importance. One is the vertical axis, that is the sequence of atrial activation, uh, concentric, eccentric, whatever. And second is the horizontal axis, that is, axis, that is the timing of atrial activation uh, after a, a causal QRS. And that can be a short, medium, or long VA interval. Uh, conduction ratios uh, um, uh, V to A are also considered. That is one-to-one -one VA ratio, um, uh, type one or type two secondary retrograde block or a complete retrograde block. That's where conduction is absent, of course. Uh, 
Block when it occurs always occurs somewhere. Uh, when you're pacing the ventricle at a relatively fixed rate and gradually increasing, the AV node fatigues. The Hisperkinji system gets better as you gradually pace faster. So gradual change works in the favor of the Hisperkinji system, uh, works against the AV node. Just the opposite with premature stimulation. The Hisperkinji system is not a fan of surprises. So if you give a premature stimulus, during a tachycardia, during sinus rhythm, after a, a, a pacing run, uh, the Hisperkinji system, its refractiveness is gauged from the uh, prior RR interval. So if it's presented with a short uh, stem-stem uh, interval, it is likely to block somewhere in the Hisperkinji system, and we take great advantage of that with some of our maneuvers. So premature stimulation in the Hisperkinji system is more likely to block than uh, the AV node, but with fixed rate pacing, and incremental, slow incremental changes in pacing rate, the AV node is the first to fail. Wind block occurs when you encounter it, may not be permanent. This may be catecholamine dependent and may awaken latent conduction. If this occurs, it's more likely to help out the AV node than an accessory pathway. AV node uh, uh, can uh, uh, awaken with catecholamines uh, a dime a dozen. Accessory pathways, if you just don't have any retrograde conduction in the baseline state, um, chances are there is no accessory pathway with retrograde conduction. Uh, it's a handful of cases in the literature where that, where that exists. All right, now this is a, a, a representation uh, off to the intracardiacs of um, a short, medium, and long RP intervals. And uh, this is really, really short. This is the, the P in the QRS. Uh, classically, you'd have a, a little bit of a, of a uh, uh, RP interval here. This is a medium RP and this is a long RP. And this, I show this because this is, these are all uh, different types of AV node reentry in one patient. If you hit the jackpot that day, had all three types of AV node reentry. Now, uh, atrial activation uh, in one to one uh, uh, SVTs. Uh, several different categorizations here. We'll go through these somewhat laboriously. If there is no discernible RP interval, that is the atrial activation is within the QRS, this is almost always AV nodal reentry. Rarely you could have an atrial tachycardia with uh, conduction down an AV nodal slow pathway, and it just so happens that the atrial tachycardia cycle length is very similar to the slow pathway conduction time, so the P wave sits in the QRS. Unusual conjunction of events, but it can occur. A short RP interval, that is with the P wave occurring within the first third of the RR interval or the diastolic interval, uh, is almost always orthodromic AV reentry. It can be AV nodal reentry, either uh, slow, slow, or even uh, anterograde, slow, retrograde, fast in uh, older individuals beyond about 65, 70, 75. The fast pathway seems to lose some of its fastball at that age. So the, the uh, a fast pathway retrograde conduction can appear in the early portion of the SC segment. Atrial tachycardias can also do this when conducted down a slow AV nodal pathway. Intermediate RP intervals, that is with the P wave occurring in the middle of the RR interval, are more typically atrial tachycardias, uh, slow, slow AV nodal reentry, uh, orthodromic AV reentry with a relatively slowly conducting or injured accessory pathway. Somebody who's had a couple of ablations and so it takes a little bit longer uh, to wind through the um, uh, uh, base of the ventricle and uh, atrium where some uh, wayward ablation has been delivered. Uh, that's uh, certainly worth considering. And then long RP tachycardia is where the P wave is in the final third of the R interval are an interesting group, some of the, the most difficult uh, uh, diagnostic uh, studies. Uh, these can be atrial tags, they can be atypical AV node reentry, anterograde fast, retrograde slow, or orthodromic reentry with a slowly conducting and or decrementally conducting accessory pathway. Uh, these are quite uh, interesting as a group. I didn't include junctional tack in most of these because uh, they can just be anything in uh, any, any of these varieties uh, and um, are relatively rare. Now, um, having said that, a lot of electrophysiologists don't even want to discuss the RP interval. Number one, it's hard to tell where the P wave is in SVT. I think we can all uh, remember cases where we argued about that and, it, and everybody was wrong. Uh, 
With intracardiac recordings, it can be extremely difficult to know whether the tachycardia has a short or medium or long RP interval. It's kind of how many electrodes do you have and, and uh, how do you categorize it? The differential diagnosis is always the same anyway. As, a, as illustrated here. So we have the RP interval, none, short, medium, or long. And uh, you, can, you can statistically get a characterization of what's most likely or least likely. But you see AV nodal reentry is everywhere here. Atrial tach is everywhere here. And uh, the only thing that's not in, in represented everywhere is orthodromic reentry. And you can't have a, a P wave inside a narrow QRS complex. Uh, and, and have orthodromic reentry. But aside from that, uh, any of these can happen. Now, to further illustrate this, uh, looking at these four complexes during SVT, where is the P wave? Is there a P wave? Well, probably there's a P wave, and you could say, well, there's a little hump here that's not part of the T wave, so it's probably there. It's probably a short to medium RP tack. And, well, oh, there's this thing here in D1. That's really not normal, so probably that's P wave. Maybe there's a second one here. Hmm, tough to know. But this would then be a medium or long RP tachycardia. Okay, well, let's throw in some intracardiac recordings just for the fun of it here. And here they are. And so this is, in fact, a short RP tachycardia. I don't see that P wave here too well, but, it, but it's, uh, it's a short RP tachycardia. No, oh, it's also a medium RP tachycardia because the AVJAs are right in the middle there. And finally, it's a long RP tachycardia because of where the timing of hybrid atrium is. So that is a reason why many electrophysiologists just say, you know, heck with it, don't, don't even bother me with this short, medium, and long RP stuff. I think it's useful to, to think in terms of what your differential diagnosis is and, and weighting things, you know, prove that it's not this as opposed to um, having to prove that it is. All right, well, this is a, a, um, from an a electroanatomic map, a CT of the heart uh, for an AF case, but it had nice casting of basically all the chambers here. So we're going to look at uh, concentric activation where it, uh, conduction goes up the septum and uh, goes up the AV node in both directions. Here I've removed the ventricles on this side over here, so you can see the two atria being activated nearly simultaneously. This gives rise to a very narrow P wave because if it takes an 80 millisecond P wave, 40 milliseconds of that from the right atrium to the septum, another 40 milliseconds traversed over the left atrium. If you're doing those simultaneously at the center, you have a very, very narrow 40, 50 millisecond P wave, easy to hide within a, a normal QRS complex. An eccentrically activated uh, uh, P wave coming from the left side looks like this with that uh, progression. From the right side, it looks like this. Uh, now, this uh, would favor a, a, an inverted P wave in the inferior leads. But if you have a, a, a pathway that's uh, way up here on the anterior lateral uh, or anterior wall of the tricuspid annulus, you can even have an, a positive uh, a P wave in the inferior leads. Same thing on the mitral annulus, a little less common. All right, so here are uh, a few examples of these different activation patterns with uh, a one-to-one -one relationship. And here's ventricular pacing at a pretty slow rate here. Uh, I show you a retrograde hiss here. I wanted to show a lot of these because I think it's a it's a very important tool to have in your uh, in your toolkit <clears throat> during these days. So here's a, an, a concentric activation pattern. First at the AVJ fanning out such that the, the catheter in the high lateral right atrium is activated about the same time as something in the lateral uh, coronary sinus. Uh, pretty good rule of thumb. Now here's an example of eccentric activation on the left side, where we have a left-sided pathway first to be activated. It's uh, pretty reasonably bracketed here. Maybe there's a potential down here. And then it goes to the AVJ and then on across to the right atrium. So the very last thing we see here is the right atrium. Contrast that with uh, an eccentric activation on the right side. And again, we had a nice retrograde his potential here. We have another one over here. Uh, and this is uh, an eccentric right side of pathway. You may say, well, this is just sinus rhythm with isorhythmic dissociation. Could be uh, for three beats, but as you pace a little bit faster, this tracks right along with it. So this actually was a right sided um, uh, accessory pathway in this case here by the 14 year old girl. Now, distinguish retrograde conduction from simply eccentric activation during an atrial tachycardia. For instance, these are two examples of atrial tachycardias. This with an eccentric activation pattern from the left, this with an eccentric activation pattern from the right, 
and neither of these are retrograde conductions. So that's why I want folks to think in terms of what does it, what is the pattern, what does it actually show, as opposed to putting an interpretation on it until you have further warrant to do that. All right, now that we've talked about the, um, the uh, horizontal axis, the VA time, we'll talk about the atrial activation patterns, the vertical axis uh, during uh, retrograde conduction. Uh, concentric activation with the AVJ earliest uh, is highly reflective of uh, going up a fast AV nodal pathway, but it certainly can be a septal accessory pathway as well. It's an important distinction, many ways to do that. If the coronary sinus osteal activation is earlier than the AVJ, this could also be going up the AV node, but typically breaking out on, on the uh, 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 rightwards extension uh, and um, uh, of the AV nodal slow pathway could also be, a, again, a, a septal accessory pathway, uh, so-called mid-septal, which is actually the only types of uh, septal pathways there are. Atrial tachycardias may manifest with either the uh, ABJ or the CS having the earliest activation. These can come from a variety of areas in the neighborhood. Important to distinguish these one from another. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this today because it's not retrograde conduction, it's natal tach. But these can be arising from a perihissing source in the right atrium, uh, coronary sinus osteum, uh, the, the proximal mitral annulus. They can be left atrial tachycardias in the right superior pulmonary vein, left side of the septum, aortomitral continuity, and they can even be really not uh, atrial origin at all. They can be from the non-coronary uh, aortic sinus valve salva. So lots of different possibilities there. Eccentric activation coming from the left side, that is the mid or distal coronary sinus, is the earliest activation. The lateral right atrium is the last thing you see. Typically, these are left free wall accessory pathways, but don't forget about left atrial or, or coronary sinus uh, atrial tachycardias. And don't forget about AV nodal pathways that may be very odd, uh, even going out uh, almost to the lateral wall. I've seen some that are, that are way posterior lateral. You'd say for sure that's an accessory pathway, and it turns out to be just a very oddball uh, AV nodal. Can be fast pathway, can be slow pathway. Uh, finally, eccentric activation on the right side. It is the right atrial recordings first, the coronary sinus recordings being the last to be represented uh, during um, uh, retrograde conduction or, or during atrial activation, I should say. These are either right free wall accessory pathways or right atrial tachycardias. I don't know of any varieties of AV nodal reentry that, that uh, nicely fit into this. Well, uh, just because you're, you have uh, one pattern of retrograde conduction doesn't mean you can't have a couple. Now, here's a person who, in whom we're pacing the ventricle at a pretty uh, stable rate here at about 400 milliseconds, uh, 150 beats a minute. And we see this activation pattern here, which uh, looks okay, uh, AVJ first. Uh, then it goes to the CSs, uh, almost the straight line here in the CS. That's a little bit odd. Uh, propagation shouldn't really look like that, but maybe our electrodes are in a funny location. And then finally, the, the right atrium. But as you go further along here, there's a shift that occurs. And um, it turns out that uh, when the AVJ fatigues, as is usually the case, the more rapidly you pace, uh, the, a the uh, AV node is the first one to bug out and uh, leaving an accessory pathway. It doesn't have to be that way, but it's typically that way. Over here, we have the coronary sinus activations basically unchanged from what they were. And uh, now the AVJ has faded and the right atrium uh, depends on going past the septum for it. So it also uh, goes out. So over here, we were going up the AV node and this left lateral accessory pathway uh, it's simultaneously. So there's a fusion of atrial activation that gradually changes over here. And by this, uh, these two complexes, it's fully going up the left-sided pathway uh, uniquely. Uh, with faster pacing, as I said, the AV node is typically the one who, who uh, uh, bails out first. Uh, the more recordings you have, the easier it is to be able to make these uh, 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 subtle determinations. If you only had the hybrid atrium, yeah, it's going out a little bit, but the morphology is just the same. It'd be hard to tell uh, with just uh, a single or a couple of catheters in there. This is another patient in whom there's a rather dramatic change in retrograde atrial activation during ventricular pacing. Uh, this is kind of reverse concentric here. Uh, the, the AVJ and the proximal CS are the last to be activated, not the first to be activated. 
So we have the hybrid atrium and uh, the lateral uh, CS being activated first and everything uh, folds in after that. And it turns out that this is a person who has, uh, and over here, this, um, uh, this right-sided uh, early activation phase at this point, and not a very rapid cycle, maybe about 700, something like that. And this person had a, 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 a right-sided, uh, I guess she had pre-excitation and retrograde conduction on the right side and uh, a concealed left side of pathway. Here they're fused, going up both pathways on this complex as well. And here only going up the left side of pathway that was quite a bit in the lab. Uh, now, uh, I want to uh, look carefully at uh, how you can use extra stimuli to tr help uh, sort out what's going on. And this is using uh, extra stimuli to surprise the hysterokinesis system and take advantage of, of its uh, inability to conduct under certain circumstances. So here we are with fixed rate ventricular pacing, a drive, and then a, a single extra stimulus, the S2. You see there's a nice retrograde hiss, uh, and uh, the hiss is typically before the local ventricular electrogram. We'll see why that is towards the end of our session here this evening. Um, but uh, you, when you're pacing from the right ventricular apex, it skates up the uh, uh, right bundle very rapidly and goes slowly muscle to muscle uh, to this uh, muscle that's immediately adjacent to, but not electrically connected to the his bundle. That's why we have a discrete interval between a his potential and the local ventricular electrogram during sinus rhythm. But here with pre premature ventricular stimulation, it's early enough that it actually encounters the right bundle before it's refracting. This is recovered from this cycle over here, remembering that the hysterokinesis system's refractive period is governed by what happened on the prior cycle. It can't anticipate, and it's not, not it's pretty lazy, so it doesn't uh, gear up its repolarization uh, for no good reason. So here we catch, catch uh, the first thing that, of the, uh, the first portion of the uh, normal conduction system that this wavefront comes to. It's the right bundle. So it blocks retrograding the right bundle, goes across the septum, up the left bundle, and then uh, the so-called hiss out the back here. Notice what happens with atrial activation. It also pushes out. So in this case, we have atrial activation that seems to depend on an antecedent hiss. You move that hiss around, the atrium follows. Uh, they're, they're linked together. Uh, so this hiss to A interval is about the same as this hiss to, the, hiss to A interval. It may, this hiss to A interval here may be a little bit longer because you're prematuring the uh, hiss one way or another uh, and, all, and by virtue of that, the AV node, so it could sling out a little bit, but, um, but shouldn't get any shorter. So in this situation, the A follows the hiss with the same or perhaps longer HA interval, and this is indicative of AV nodal conduction. The more, uh, more premature your extra stimulus, the further in the hiss, uh, eventually uh, you'll come to the functional refractive period and uh, the hiss won't uh, move in anymore. Contrast that situation to this situation here, where again we have retrograde hisses that can be gained up here before the local ventricular electrogram. One on the extra stimulus, it blocks in the right bundle retrogradely, goes across the septum, comes up there, the uh, left, and here it is, big deal. The A follows it, big deal. That's, that's nothing special. But what is special here is that these are the A's during the drive cycle, and you have this HA interval here, but now we have this HA interval. That's not right. Uh, in fact, some of these A's almost start simultaneously with the Hiss. So these A's are being activated independently of this. And in fact, this is a concentric activation pattern here. It looks pretty concentric, but now, the right atrium and AVJ are, are slung further out. So this probably had some conduction up the left side of the pathway and the AV node. And now uh, with the Hiss going out, uh, we're going up only the, uh, the accessory pathway here. So that H, that, that's the atrial activation sequence there versus the uh, earliest atrial activation. Here it is in the AVJ. Here it is now in the uh, uh, distal CS, uh, lateral CS. This is an even more egregious example here in which we have uh, an extra stimulus giving rise to that hiss out the back there, but the A occurs actually before the hiss. So there's no possibility whatsoever that this A was uh, conducting up the hysterokinesis system up the AV node. This is going up an accessory pathway. So you can use extra stimuli 
during sinus rhythm, during uh, following a slow ventricular drive, to your advantage to help tease out whether conduction is uh, capable of going up an accessory pathway or not, even when it may not be so evident during fixed rate pacing. We'll come back to that. So here's this atrial activation sequence, uh, pretty much the same on, on both the drive beats and the extra stimulus. And the hiss is just totally irrelevant. Here, here it is before the local V, here it is after the local V, and it's saying, hey, follow me. And the atrium saying, I don't need to, I got another way of, of getting back uh, uh, over uh, an accessory pathway. So there's those hisses and hiss activation. In this case, the A, A precedes the hiss and it is uh, indicative of accessory pathway conduction. Now, uh, a trick that you can use when it's, especially with septal pathways in which your uh, activation sequence is gonna be very similar, whether conducting over a pretty good AV node or over the, um, uh, an accessory pathway, is to use the element of surprise on the his Purkinje system again. And that is coming from sinus rhythm and giving a relatively rapid burst of ventricular pacing. The first few cycles will catch the his Purkinje system by surprise. Uh, here's a, a retrograde hiss here, but then on this second complex, the hiss is way out here, then the hiss is over here. Uh, in fact, um, these, uh, we'll come back to that in a second. And, but by the time you have paced for several cycles, uh, the his Purkinje system accommodates to the, the more rapid cycle length of pacing and it says, okay, now I'm gonna repolarize more rapidly and eventually you start conducting one-to-one. -one. We don't see that here just yet. But the interesting part here is that we have a hiss before an A and now we have a hiss after an A. And in fact, uh, these complexes here are uh, fused uh, going up an accessory pathway and turning back around and going down the AV node. And uh, so these are fused with pacing and anterograde conduction for a couple of cycles here. So this is before ablation of a septal pathway, pretty near the uh, the AV nodal region, and we're but there's no pre excitation, so we can't go by that. After successful ablation, so there are those A's there, uh, independent of his activation. The his is just kind of doing its own thing, and here's an A again, well before the his over there, just uh, trying to help out the best it can, but it's uh, it's uh, still uh, quite delayed. Uh, so in this case, a retrograde conduction is independent of the hiss and uh, indicates the presence of an accessory pathway. That you, if you've done some ablation already during this case, you got more work to do. Uh, now, uh, we've done some work, we've done some more ablation here, and we're doing the same thing, first pacing the hiss, trying to get it separated out so we can see it clearly between complexes here and discern whether atrial activation, in fact, depends on the presence of that hiss or it doesn't care about the presence of the hiss. So here's a, a sinus complex that doesn't count as a retrograde hiss. Here's a hiss out the back uh, and an A follows it. And uh, here's another hiss before the local V and A follows it. Here's another hiss, uh, so this is two to one going up to his Purkinje system. If we paced for a little bit longer, we'd gradually go to one to one, we wouldn't learn anything. But as when we can surprise it and get it to dance around here, you can get it uh, to give you some information about his dependence or independence of uh, atrial activation. And in this case now, we have uh, the atrial activation dependent on the his. So this is going up the AV node, the pathway has been successfully ablated. Great. All right, uh, now, so we've been talking about uh, one to one uh, VA relationships. Now we're gonna be talking about second degree VA block. Um, we may not have one to one conduction during ventricular pacing. When you have a gradual increase in the VA interval with incremental rates of pacing, and then finally have uh, retrograde winky uh, that is indicative far more likely of the AV node than an accessory pathway. There are exceptions to this, but as a general rule, uh, the faster you pace, um, uh, the AV node will, will gradually uh, increase its stem to A or VA interval and finally start winky -bocking. Accessory pathways can do that, but uh, but they're not characteristic. It's more of an all or none, uh, generally all or none uh, phenomenon that's indicated here. So a minimal increase or no increase in the VA interval with more rapid pacing, uh, eventuating to the point of two to one VA block uh, are, is far more uh, characteristic of accessory pathways, but be careful because AV nodal fast pathways, especially in individuals who have AV nodal reentry can behave exactly like that. It behaves much more like uh, accessory pathway or normal atrial muscle 
than, uh, than it does uh, even old decamel tissue. Retrograde conduction can also be assessed in response to extra stimuli. We saw a little bit of that uh, uh, earlier with uh, the hiss coming out the back and whether the uh, uh, A is dependent on the presence of a hiss or not. And um, if you have a gradual increase in the uh, VA interval or the HA interval after extra stimuli, much more likely you're dealing with the AV node than an accessory pathway. Contrary-wise, if there's no increase or minimal increase in the VA interval or uh, a, an HA interval that's shorter than it was on your drive, it's not really an HA interval. That implies that there actually is H going to A. But there's an H, and then there's an A, and that interval, that pseudo interval, is shorter uh, because it's not conducting over the Hisperkinji system and AV node. That indicates the presence of an accessory pathway. We saw examples of that earlier. I, I can't stress enough how important it is to have a good his potential uh, on your side here to uh, and, and work for this and work to find a ventricular pacing site and his recording site that can give you a, a decent retrograde his. It really helps out in making this determination of whether your atrial activation depends on or doesn't depend on uh, prior activation of the his uh, potential and therefore whether it's going up the normal conduction system or an accessory pathway. Here's an example of retrograde AV nodal winky bock. We're used to seeing AV winky bock with a gradual prolongation of the uh, downstream effect with a constant uh, or slightly more rapid upstream input. Here we're having input from below and uh, seeing what happens uh, on, on the downstream side, which is actually in the atrium. So we have, again, a retrograde hiss coming off here on each complex. And you would say, just on the face of it, the fact that we don't have um, um, A's on every single beat, we're missing them here, uh, says that yes, we're blocking retrogradely and it's got to be in the AV node because we got to the hiss and uh, if you get to the hiss, you can pretty much get through the hiss and present the complex to the AV node. So here our, our stemmed A is gradually prolonging until it fails and then the cycle repeats over here with a shorter and then gradually longer VA interval. We, we should all be accustomed to recognizing that. Uh, I have a couple of examples of uh, instances in which conduction uh, goes one-to-one -one and then suddenly goes to two-to-one. Uh, this is one of those. And uh, in this instance, when we're with one-to-one -one conduction, the stem to the uh, this uh, atrial signal here, 153 milliseconds, when it goes to two-to-one over here, it's not much different. It's about 149 within the, within the range of error here. So there's minimal increment from the, your slowest pace cycling to your most rapid cycling where you go one to one and then uh, down to two to one in the presence of an accessory pathway. They're typically all or none. There are exceptions to this. Almost always there are exceptions to everything. But uh, it's a pretty good rule of thumb that um, uh, you don't have much uh, increment in the stem to A, the VA interval, uh, when you're pacing uh, on an, ex uh, an accessory pathway until you get down to very close to uh, refractiveness. Now, this is uh, an interesting case here, where again, we go from one to one, suddenly to two to one conduction. It's not winky blocking, it's, it's just two to one conduction. And uh, th there's a little uh, slight difference here, because if you look at this stemmed A here, it's clearly longer over here than over here. And uh, they measure out to 193 milliseconds when we had one to one conduction, and now it's 159 when it goes to two to one. Uh, and this, type of this degree of disparity is more typical behavior for an AV node. And in fact, this was going up an AV nodal fast pathway in a, in a moderately uh, uh, mature woman with uh, an older woman, I should say, with a typical AV nodal reentry. She'd had it for years, she finally got tired of it, uh, presented herself for a study, and this is what she had. Now, uh, I want to focus for a, a few minutes on retrograde block. Uh, boy, this is a, a, a downfall on uh, the board exam. People just, for some reason, have a great deal of difficulty at determining whether there is even VA conduction. Sad to say, even some of my fellows on some rare occasions have a difficult time with this. I'm not going to mention any names. And when block occurs retrogradely, it always occurs somewhere. And uh, by and large, with fixed rate pacing, it's in the AV note. In fact, I'll say, I'll say, 99%, I'll say more than 99% of the time. 99.5% of the time, maybe more than that. When you have fixed rate pacing, 
and you're not conducting uh, to the atrium at all, the block is in the AV node. So you can look really smart uh, if your attending says, hey, uh, we got retrograde uh, block here, where's the block? And you say, well, it's the AV node, uh, without even looking at the thing. You'll be right, um, um, except 0.5% of the time. Now, we can be smarter than that. We can know why that's the case instead of just going by the numbers. And what's going on here is that we have sinus A's along in here. There's one hidden in here. There's one there. There's one there. And there's one over here. And we have a PR interval that's normal over here. There's a first uh, stimulated complex doesn't really capture very much. So that's a, a normal anti-grade conduction. Same thing off over here. And uh, when you don't have any retrograde conduction, it's important to recognize this. And there are easy ways to look at this. The A's are regular. Typically, there's a sinus activation sequence if you've got enough uh, catheters to look, uh, electrodes to look at for that. And the A's are slower than the V's when you're pacing the ventricle. Now, um, you can also look at your surface ECG. Remember, that's an important tool that we have and say, yeah, that's, um, that looks like a sinus P wave there. Can't really see it too well in here, but it seems like it may be deformed at the uh, peak of that T wave with positive uh, complex, just like it is over here. Uh, now, when you have block in the AV node, uh, a cardinal feature of this is concealed conduction. Everyone knows what concealed conduction is. It's when you have penetration of a structure, most typically on an everyday basis, it's the AV node. Conduction into, but not through the structure. And it renders it partially refractory such that subsequent impulses have a difficult time or, or um, have no chance at getting through uh, the uh, structure, most typically in the AV node. So here we are coming along, we're pacing in the ventricle, we don't have any VA conduction, and look at this, This, this uh, we have retrograde hisses all along the way, so you say, okay, uh, I know what's going on here, we have retrograde hisses, it's getting to the hiss, through the hiss, you say when you're pacing at a slow rate, the Hispercandy system is your friend, uh, it, it conducts faithfully, uh, so if we have block, it's gotta be the AV node. Good reasoning, but it's even better reasoning to look at what happens over here. Look at this PR interval, look at this AH interval. It's dramatically longer than it was on either this speed over here or this speed over here, which we use as our, 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 uh, our, our, uh, our golden jeeps to look at and say, okay, that's my standard. And I'm gonna evaluate this speed over here as uh, against the standard over here. This is what normal conduction looks like. What's going on here? Well, why is this AH longer? Why is this PR longer? It's because we've had concealed conduction that penetrated into the AV node and rendered it partially refractory such that the next atrial complex to come down has a harder time getting through. It takes a little bit longer. A common phenomenon in the AV node in, in both directions, antro and retrograde. So there's that much wider uh, PR, much longer AH. And uh, I want to illustrate to you that you don't even need the intracritic recorders. There it is. It's right there. You can tell by this. Uh, why, isn't, why is there such a longer PR interval here? Than over here. It's because we had concealed conduction into the AV node. Uh, very, very straightforward concept. Now, here's something that you're probably not going to see real often. In fact, I know you're not going to see it real often because I have about three or four examples of this. I look at the hiss in practically every case. I've done thousands and thousands of cases, and I've only seen this phenomenon a few times. And believe you me, I look for it. So here it is. This is retrograde block in the Hispurkinji system. It doesn't even get to the His bundle. How can you tell? Well, remember if we are getting through the His and into the AV node, we should have some effect on this AH interval. Look, it's just always the same here. We don't have any hisses before or after a local ventricular electrogram, and this is AV or VA block. The A's are again regular. It's a sinus activation sequence. We have a sinus P wave here. And these activation sequences are the same, so I can infer that each of these complexes, regular as they are, are all sinus complexes, same thing over here. And yet there's no influence of what goes on below that in the ventricle on, on that AH interval. Uh, so um, if the AH and PR interval are constant, uh, or not the PR interval, but the AH interval uh, is constant, or a, a PR once you stop pacing, uh, or if there's a, a complex gets through, that means there's no penetration of the AV node, no concealment, and uh, block is, is before you get to the HIS. Now this person has a really sick his Purkinje system. There's that AH interval. Here it is during sinus rhythm. AH interval is exactly the same. There's been no effect of the ventricular pacing on it. Uh, 
And this HV here is, I don't know, about each one of these is 100 milliseconds. That's probably about 130, uh, 120, 130 millisecond HV interval with left on the branch block, sick hypertension system, maybe some uh, anterior medicines have a little bit to do in the mix there as well. But this patient brought a lot uh, to the table himself with a very ill hypertension system. All right, another uh, way that uh, uh, people stumble on uh, board exams is retrograde dual AV nodal pathways. These are uh, quite common in the population, pretty irrelevant, not too many people uh, use these in any form of SQT scan. Uh, and uh, boy, the, those bad guys on the board uh, exam, uh, there's, I know at least one of them that's in on this, um, this uh, broadcast here. Uh, they like these questions because they test what the candidate knows. Not so important to look at physiologically, but it tests the metal of the candidate. Now, how do you recognize retrograde dual pathways? Well, they have two different and relatively discrete VA intervals, just like with anterograde dual pathways, you have discrete AH intervals or AV intervals. In this situation, you also typically, not always, but typically have two different atrial activation sequences when you're uh, jumping between pathways. AV nodal echoes of an atypical nature that is anterograde fast, retrograde slow, may occur at the time of switching between one pathway and the other. So the way this works is during slow ventricular pacing, uh, ordinarily activation goes up the fast pathway. And then as you pace a little bit faster or the fast pathway fatigues, uh, uh, and this gives rise to a short VA interval with earliest activation in the AVJ. But as the uh, pacing goes on, the fast pathway suddenly fails and it shifts, instead of blocking entirely, it just shifts to the slow pathway. Now, the difference between the fast pathway and the slow pathway is one is faster than the other. That's how come it's called the fast pathway. So it conducts rapidly, gets back to the atrium with a short conduction time. When it fails, it reveals the presence of a slow pathway, which isn't only distinguished thereby, but it also has a different atrial activation pattern, most typically earliest activation in the proximal CS near the coronary sinus ostium. I have a couple of cases where it's just exactly the opposite of that, where the fast pathway seems to exit closer to the CS os and the slow pathway exits northward, very unusual situation. Uh, but by and large, uh, in the examples I'll show, uh, this is the rule here. Fast pathway, AVJ is earliest, slow pathway, CSOS is earliest. When that shift occurs, such that you're blocking in the fast pathway retrograde, going uh, up the slow pathway, now you can come back down the fast pathway and uh, activate the HIS and, uh, and actually uh, cause a QRS complex which may be the same as the baseline QRS complex during sinus rhythm, or it may be fused with pacing, depending on what your pacing rate is and the uh, slow pathway retrograde conduction time. So here we are, we're pacing along in the ventricle, uh, minding our own business, nice retrograde hiss here. It's there on all of these complexes. Uh, the A's are here on all these complexes also, except for this one. Oh, but wait, just wait long enough, and there's another A here. Now, uh, you could say, well, this is just a PAC, you could say it's a sinus complex. Well, if you tried to tell me it's a sinus complex, you'd be way wrong because the atrial activation sequence is very wrong for that. The P wave is inverted. Remember the surface ECG as well. So here we are conducting along, uh, earliest up a fast pathway, fast pathway conducting uh, with a fast conduction time and earliest in the AVJ. Then when we block in the fast pathway, all of a sudden we go earliest in the coronary sinus os region go uh, up the slow pathway, it can turn around the end of fast pathway. So we have this long, short uh, sequence here, not long shorting like in uh, Ashman's uh, phenomenon, but uh, going up a slow pathway back down a fast and an atypical AV nodal echo. Now this is not a normal looking QRS complex. It's fused between normal complex and uh, the um, um, uh, paste complex over here. Uh, so we'll see another example here where we're coming along at very slow uh, fixed rate of pacing. And this instance here, we again have earliest activation in the AVJ. Not many people would call this a fast pathway. This is, uh, you know, a, about a, a 250 millisecond conduction interval. Well, it happens to be fast for this person because when we continue pacing, 
uh, it suddenly shifts to the ABJ not being any earliest, but the CS OS now pulling way in and uh, almost uh, coincident with the ABJ, but a much longer VA time here and a narrow QRS. In fact, uh, a, a completely normal QRS because the stimulus artifact occurs after the local ventricular electrogram that it would have tried to capture. So this is a, an instance of, uh, again, retrograde dual pathways with a, a pretty sluggish retrograde fast pathway, uh, blocks in the fast, goes uh, up the slow, back down the fast with a, a completely normal uh, QRS complex here. Uh, now, when you are pacing the ventricle at a relatively slow rate, fixed rate, and uh, you don't have consistent uh, don't appear to have consistent ventricular capture. Think of a couple of things here. Think of the absence of retrograde conduction entirely, and then you have uh, the uh, uh, ventricular pacing uh, uh, run is interrupted by sinus capture beats along the way. Uh, if you saw something like this and there's no VA conduction, you could have a, a P wave that just happens to occur there and conducts down the ventricle. You could have, as here, retrograde dual pathways with atypical lady nodal uh, echoes going up a slow down a fast. This will tend to be highly repetitive because you, you have three or four cycles going up the fast, it blocks in the fast, goes up the slow, goes down the fast, and echo, the next speed starts the cycle again. It, it is less, the least likely possibility for inconsistent ventricular capture is inadequate stimulation output. How many times do you try to crank up the output? It doesn't do any good because that's not the problem. This has no chance of capturing here, and it's not because the, the, the output is inadequate. The output's just great here. The problem is that you interrupted your pacing drive with uh, the, these retrograde duels here. Now, a little bit of fun here uh, as we're, we're getting close to wrapping up uh, with uh, retrograde conduction. This is uh, some problems in the, in the Hispurkinji system uh, retrograde. Now, we're used to seeing with extra stimuli, the hiss out the back, that's great. Uh, that's nothing new. But here during our drive beats, the hiss is out the back. It's usually in front of the carrots. Remember I said, when we are pacing the ventricle, the right ventricle towards the apex, somewhere on the septum uh, near the moderator band, you get into the right bundle pretty quickly. It skates up the right bundle uh, very rapidly. His Purkinje system activates the hiss retrogradely way up front here before conduction goes muscle to muscle to this ventricular activation here. So why is the hiss out the back even during a slow drive beats? Uh, that acts like there's block in the right bundle already. Well, look in our sinus beat and yeah, there is block in the right bundle already. Uh, so uh, there's uh, proof of uh, uh, truth in uh, electrophysiology here. And all is a beautiful thing. And uh, we have some uh, VA conduction here along the way as well, just for the fun of it. Now, uh, here's a diag diagrammatic representation of what's going on here. This patient over here, I will postulate, has a normal QRS complex, uh, normal uh, QRS duration, normal Hispurkinji activation during sinus rhythm. And so when you pace the right ventricular apex, we have our hiss in front here. We have our local ventricular activation in the, in the uh, perihissian uh, septum uh, delayed after that. And the reason for that is we're, when we're stimulating there, it goes rapidly up the Hispurkinji system, slowly muscle to muscle, and then activates this other tissue here. Now, when we're, uh, when we have right bundle branch block in sinus rhythm, such as this patient over here, uh, we try to do the same thing. Let's start over here, going rocketing up the, the right bundle, slowly muscle to muscle. But in this situation over here, we stimulate try to go up the right bundle of blocks, it still goes slowly muscle to muscle. So it gets to the local V here about the same time, but the hiss is activated by this long circuitous way. It has to go across uh, the, uh, the septum uh, and up the left bundle to get to the rest of the, uh, the Hispurkinji system. So that's why the hiss is out the back there. And you can see that during drive beats when you have right bundle branch block during sinus rhythm, you see it routinely during closely coupled ventricular extra stimuli in the right ventricle where you block retrogradely in the right bundle just like this. Now, a few years ago, uh, the, uh, the group from uh, Cornell uh, with their great expertise in um, uh, use of adenosine, I just gave a bunch of adenosine to a bunch of folks and said, how can we use this information up front, the beginning of an EP study, looking for uh, uh, diagnostic uh, information regarding NCTs. 
Well, uh, they gave adenosine 12 milligrams up front during ventricular pacing. And if BA block was present, um, uh, you didn't have to go any further. If BA conduction was still present, you just jack up the ante a little bit and pace a little bit more uh, or give a little bit more adenosine. 24 milligrams, that'll knock out uh, most uh, horses as well as AV nodes. And then you add a few more people who have uh, VA block. So the total number of people of this 139 who had VA block with adenosine was uh, 97. And almost all of these uh, did not have an accessory pathway. So if you have adenosine sensitive retrograde conduction, almost never is it um, an accessory pathway. The exceptions were uh, patients who had an adenosine uh, sensitive um, accessory pathway. A little bit of an unusual crowd here. I wouldn't think there'd be that many, but, uh, but they were in this case. Um, if you have VA conduction, uh, it may or may not be orthotelic uh, SVT to an accessory pathway. Another way of looking at it is uh, giving 12 to 24 milligrams of adenosine during uh, ventricular pacing. And if uh, VA block is present with that, it's really, really unlikely to have uh, 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 an accessory pathway. Can occur under certain circumstances, and the rest of this is, uh, is pretty self-explanatory. Here, I'll leave this to your reading. You'll have this. Um, uh, Dr. Verm is going to, to post this later uh, for uh, your uh, further study if you choose to do that. Now, a little, uh, just uh, ending up here, a few uh, little uh, straggling uh, tidbits here. Uh, you may have retrograde conduction present even when AV conduction is absent. And this uh, is an interesting thing. You go into to put in a pacemaker with some, uh, in somebody who has complete heart block, and lo and behold, uh, they have nice retrograde conduction. Just like you can have no VA conduction in somebody who has very robust AV conduction, you can have good VA conduction uh, when AV conduction is absent. Retrograde AV node conduction, rarely accessory pathway conduction may be absent uh, when you get into the lab and you're first pacing the ventricle. Uh, and in those cases, uh, an atrial tachycardia is more likely what's going on if they have an SVT. You can wake up uh, an AV node pretty easily with some catecholamines, uh, maybe 5-10% of uh, patients with uh, documented AV node reentry and whom you can initiate AV node reentry with um, uh, presence of uh, catecholamines will not have AV, uh, VA conduction in the baseline state. Really unusual for an accessory pathway to do that. Uh, a retrograde uh, AV nodal conduction pattern is typically midline but can be eccentric. Uh, with these oddball pathways going off into the, uh, the coronary sinus, even pretty deeply into the coronary sinus. And uh, finally, demonstration of a concealed left lateral pathway uh, can be difficult if you're pacing the right ventricle and it skates up the AV node. It's up the hypocampus and AV node very rapidly. And you say, well, I don't have a left lateral pathway. Sometimes you may uh, need left ventricular stimulation uh, via transeptal or retrograde access or uh, sneaking a catheter out of the coronary venous branch and be able to see that, yeah, I do have uh, retrograde conduction of uh, the left uh, system. Sometimes you have to um, get another catheter into the, to the left ventricle and pace to uh, really be able to assess whether you're, uh, what your earliest activation or the, where a pathway is with um, uh, uh, in the presence of very good uh, VA conduction of the normal system. Here's an example of that where we're pacing the right ventricle here. And we have a, a midline activation sequence here. And um, it's, it's a little funny out here. This person who's had a couple of different uh, prior ablation attempts with a left lateral pathway. And uh, so it's a concentric activation pattern. Uh, but when we uh, pace the left ventricle here through the ablation catheter, you see, yeah, we still got uh, basically concentric, but there's some stuff going on over here as well. And there's still uh, left, uh, left eccentric activation. And we wouldn't have been able to see that very well at all uh, where we just pace it from the right ventricle. And you can say, well, we just pace faster, have the AV node fatigue. Usually that works, not all, all the time. And I'm not sure that you want to pace at 300 milliseconds or 250 milliseconds when you're napping retrogradely just to, uh, to show exclusive pathway activation. Uh, you may need to do that with uh, right ventricular uh, basal pacing as well. Uh, if you've got a very slick AV node, you're pacing the RV septum and a, a lateral right atrial uh, AV uh, pathway that doesn't connect very well. So in summary, retrograde conduction is important to understand. It may be present or absent. 
there are different patterns of atrial activation and they imply different things uh, about uh, what pathway you may be traversing. Don't forget to look at the surface ECG for the P wave morphology. It can be very helpful sometimes and make or break uh, the situation. Don't, in your mind, retrograde uh, uh, equate um, a, a, a retrograde P wave with an inverted P waves in the inferior leads. That's a description. It doesn't imply a mechanism. Uh, it could be an atrial tachycardia. Retrograde conduction has consistent features with fixed rate pacing or, or slow, uh, uh, slowly faster pacing. The AV node fatigues earlier than the Hispurkinji system, whereas with premature extra stimuli, the Hispurkinji system fatigues more rapidly than the AV node. You can use this to your advantage and um, uh, make sure you can uh, distinguish between uh, accessory pathways and uh, uh, normal conduction using extra stimuli. Keep an eye on that his. Uh, whether VA conduction is dependent on it or not, it will be your friend. And, um, and beware of retrograde dual avionodal pathways. And I think we may have time for some questions here, Dr. Verma. Yeah, it was, you, you have those um, audience response questions okay. if you'd like to go over them. Right. So uh, you stop me when it's time to stop, but we have four questions here. This is question number one. Uh, we have intracardiac and surface recordings of a 34-year-old man who's undergoing EP study for evaluation of palpitations. Our figure shows one of the following. Not a mul it's a multiple choice, so one correct answer. I think everyone should be able to see the poll I put up. Take a look, take a little bit of time. Maybe while they're looking at that, I can ask you a couple of the questions that have come through. Sure, yeah. um, one was uh, tips for getting that beautiful retrograde hiss that you seem to have on all your slides side of pacing or where you yeah. put the catheter? It's a, it's a combination of where you can record a decent his potential during sinus and, um, and having that being nice and stable. And then pacing a variety of areas on the septum. Some people favor uh, pacing very basally. Uh, I like to pace a little bit more apically, mid septum or more apically. And it just makes the differential in the conduction time going up the right bundle. Um, it, it accentuates that uh, physical and electrical distance and, and makes it much more advantageous, I think, to see that uh, his very um, uh, before the local ventricular electrogram. Now, if you use very closely spaced uh, electrodes in your his recording, uh, it's not such a problem. But uh, with, with our standard uh, five millimeter spacing on a quarter polar catheter, uh, I like to, to uh, move around the right ventricle a little bit and, and pick a good pacing site and uh, keep it there. We have, you know, um, 35, 36% of people who have voted. Looks like the majority are choosing no retrograde conduction and blocking the AV node. And bully for them, that is correct. And um, uh, so we see, uh, I how I should have done it. This AH interval here, we, first of all, we have regular A's along the way here with a sinus activation sequence. And on the exam, they're not terrible people that write these questions, I can tell you that. But uh, so they give you all the information you need and you just need to figure out where to look for that information. So here we know what the PR interval and the AH interval should be with normal conduction. Here it's longer, inexplicably longer. Well, it does have an explanation because we have concealed conduction here. All right, so uh, sinus activation sequence, um, blah, 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 we've already talked about that. Go on to the next one? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pull this out of the way here for a second. Um, which of these uh, statements concerning retrograde conduction in the above figure is true? Uh, and you can see your choices there. And I'm gonna pull this just a little bit off to the side here uh, so uh, the folks can be pulled off to this side of it so folks can see. And then another question that came through on the slide where you had bidirectional right bundle branch block on the uh, premature ventricular extra stim, the H moved out significantly further than at baseline. What accounts for the additional delay there? Yeah, I, I, it's hard to know. I think it could be transeptal conduction in that situation because if we already have retrograde block in the right bundle, you would think, hey, you know, it's not going to take any longer to get to the right bundle than it had but there are other things interposed in there going up the left bundle. But more than likely, it's, it's um, tissue, uh, the closest to your stimulation site is gonna have the wavefront 
um, encounter it first, it's going to have the longest uh, refractiveness. So more than likely, it's just the of the conduction. We could answer that by having a catheter on the other side of the left ventricle and recording left left on the potential. Give him a few more seconds. All right, 66 votes, 70 votes. All right, very good. Uh, and it turns out that that wins, uh, and there's a good reason for that. Is it is uh, correct. And you guys either looked at the answers beforehand or you're just ultra smart. Uh, what we have here is a situation in which, in, I'm sorry, in each of these cases, each of these complexes, sorry about that. Okay, one more time. We have uh, the CSs are exactly the same. The AVJ pushes out. The stem to A is the same in the CSs. So we are conducting up an accessory pathway all the time. And uh, in the AV node with the AVJ a little bit earlier here on other uh, instances. Very good. All right, third question here. Uh, which of these statements concerning retrograde conduction in the above figure is true? There are your choices. Uh, we'll have to refresh the uh, poll over here as well. Okay, we're done. And I'm going to pull that over here again so we can see our electrograms. We're, we're starting to slow down here. That is cool. Oh boy. It's exciting. <laughs> Two of the answers are tied. Wow. All right, well we'll we'll go with what Let we got. Okay. And this so I think they can see the results now. Ooh just wins with uh, with D there. Well, it turns out D is correct. It is going over the AV node in all these complexes. Uh, you see that the AVJ here is, uh, uh, there's our hiss out the back and the A's follow it, uh, but, um, and there's our earliest activation. We're actually going over a right lateral pathway over here because it's even earlier than our AVJ. That fails on this complex over here, and we're just going up the AV node uh, on that one. So AV node's governing uh, activation on all three complexes. We know that because the, the um, uh, uh, CSAs are uh, around the same time as they are at these A's over here, AVJ. All right, uh, and there's, that A is a little hidden here, but if you can see it here, you should have seen it there, but it's in the kids. All right, the last question here, easy question. A man with documented SVT undergoes EP study. You have the usual differential diagnosis. In the baseline state, uh, you, without any sedation, he doesn't have any retrograde conduction. With this finding and knowing that he has documented SVT, I want you to rank the possible choices of uh, possible diagnoses in uh, rank order. So the most likely to the least likely. Uh, I'll ask you another question while we're waiting. Um, there was a question on uh, supranormal conduction and whether, I guess, is that a real phenomenon that we see? Well, I'm not sure we see it in real life. We see it in, uh, in uh, cellular preps um, occasionally, but I, I think pretty much anytime you um, are thinking about supernormal conduction, uh, 
as an explanation for, uh, for a phenomenon that's observed. There are other alternative explanations that probably fit better, but it's, it's a great thing to pull out of your bag of tricks. There's the gap phenomenon, there's concealed conduction, there's supernormal conduction. If, if you're really stumped, you could just start doing some word salad, throwing those guys out and, and <laughs> maybe deflect some oh, attention for a while. Okay. Uh, Let's end this one. Uh, boy, you know, you guys are just right on here and uh, you were listening or you already knew this. And uh, I consider my job done because uh, everybody, the majority got all of these right. I didn't, didn't have any uh, real good curveballs here. I'll try better next time.